Okay, we are going to get started. All right, we're going to get started. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Uh, what a year 2019 was, uh, especially if you like business. Anybody here know how much the S&P 500 went up in 2019? Uh, someone raise your hand, please, because uh, yeah, some, just raise your hand and I'll pick on you. Anybody know how much? Yes, Rob Sinclair. 28%? Incorrect. Sorry. <laughs> You're wrong. <laughs> no. uh, Noah. 35? Wrong. Okay. Close. You're both close. So I'll be nicer now. You're both close. Anybody else? I just looked it up today. Okay. Yes, Ellery. No. <laughs> all right, let's see. Yeah, Stuart? 23? You're all in the range, but that's not quite good enough. 31%, okay? 31%. What a great time to be an investor, all right? So that, that's a pretty, pretty cool thing. So I got to say, you know, starting a new business, which is part of what we're all here talking about, is a pretty exciting thing, right? I mean, last year, if you take a look, this is, you know, in the venture world, in the early stage world, all that happened was that the valuations of companies went up. Isn't that great? They just got higher and higher and higher. So it's a fun and great and wonderful time to start a new business. Hey, your Uber, you know, the, IP, the biggest IPO, the first biggest IPO in history, had a lot of groundbreaking IPOs, super awesome. WeWork also, you know, was a great year, growing a lot of funding, valuation, everything. That was all really great. So it was very, very exciting. But I think some of you, oh yeah, and close to home here, there's brand new startups doing amazing things. This is a Seattle startup that came out of the University of Washington. <coughs> um, that uh, is an amazing football. I don't know anything about football. So just by the way, when I make sports references and they're completely wrong, uh, just don't say anything, okay? Uh, but here's this super hot company. It raised $28.5 million in a Series B before it had actually sold anything to anybody. Um, Aaron Rodgers, who I think is a football player uh, in this thing called the NFL, uh, he joined in this giant round of funding. So, you know, it's like really easy to raise money. It's really easy to go out and start a company. Isn't that terrific? So, uh, but <clears throat> at the same time, it can be at least let's say intimidating, right? So it's fun to go on a roller coaster ride. I don't know if you know, but like roller coasters go up, they go the other direction too. So some of us know what happened to Uber, the biggest uh, tech IPO in forever. Uh, it's lost a huge percentage of its value, way below its IPO price. Uh, anybody know, uh, anybody wanna say anything about what happened to WeWork? Anybody know that company? Yeah? Anybody want to raise their hand and say, yes, back there, Kurt. Their business model really wasn't viable, but a bank kept giving them a lot of money. That's close, yes. Uh, a bank, uh, it's actually a bank called SoftBank, uh, which had a thing called the Vision Fund, which is the largest venture fund in the history of the world, uh, run by this guy, Masayoshi's son, who was the first funder of my fund. Uh, great guy, interesting nutcase. Uh, <laughs> Well, they ended up writing down 9.2 billion on WeWork in part because we were just overspent like crazy and had those unbelievable valuations. And that's only the beginning of the bad news for them. I don't pity this guy very much at all. He's a bazillionaire. Uh, and then you also, I don't know if any of you read about this, but that wonderful football helmet company uh, Got 400 investors, incredible superstar investors, and now it is out of business. It's gone, right? There's nothing. Uh, so uh, starting a business can be really, really fun and exciting, and it can also be very, very challenging. So this is not, for all of you here, this game is not for the faint of heart, okay? Uh, it, it uh, and you know, to put this in sort of not just a generic, you know, sort of storyline, actually, you know, the real numbers are behind this too. 50% of new businesses fail within the first uh, five years. 60% will fail in the first six years. And 90% of all startups fail within the first 10 years. Okay. That, that, that's very heartening. So all of those, <laughs> you all, I see you all now wanting to leave and 
go out the door. Uh, actually, that's not only what we're here to talk about. Um, we're here to talk about entrepreneurship and also kind of the remedy for this kind of problem, which is uh, something that many of these companies didn't actually have. They just had, we were talking just a minute ago about having a vision and a mission. They were, some of these companies had amazing visions, extremely powerful missions, right, about changing the world and doing all kinds of amazing stuff, but they didn't have something uh, that really helped them go from point A to point B. So you may have a vision of the world, but do you know how you're gonna go from where you are? They need something. It's called a plan, right? Uh, without a plan, uh, and there's a quote, I, there's a guy, uh, Roland, Roald Radmussen, or Ardmussen, he f discovered the first guy to like go to the South Pole. He said this great thing, he said, adventure is just another word for bad planning. Okay, <laughs> so our purpose here is to help you become, have a greater likelihood, be an entrepreneur, either in your life or with a new company or in your career or whatever else, but don't just have that wonderful spirit of entrepreneurship, balance that with actually something called reason and thoughtfulness and a plan. And we're gonna try to help you make that easy. So um, today we're just starting, which is the plan for getting a plan. I'm gonna talk to you today about a few things. First of all, the basics of the class, who am I? What am I doing here? Why should you listen to me at all? Uh, what's the outline for the class? And some of the key concepts we'll, we will be covering. Um, some expectations and logistics. Um, I, I, I note that many of you are concerned about things like passing. Uh, and so we'll talk about how that'll work. Uh, and then, uh, interestingly, uh, behind all of this, you're fortunate enough to go to the University of Washington, where there are a number of business plan competitions. Uh, where you can actually take all of what you've learned here and put it to the test uh, and actually go and see if you can't win a competition and even get some funding. Uh, and so to help explain those competitions, give you a sense of how they work, is my wonderful colleague, Sarah, and also Amy, uh, who will talk about both all the resources that are available to you, but then also how these amazing competitions actually work. And then we'll close with a real entrepreneur who is living exactly this life, both the ups and the downs of that, uh, and a friend of mine, Ambika Singh, who is the uh, CEO, also known as uh, Chief Boss Lady of uh, Armoire, which is a really, really cool um, consumer-oriented service. And she'll share both her experience and her lessons learned. So that's the outline for this evening. So, and then we'll do a little wrap up. Uh, let's dive in. So. The basics of how this class is going to work. So first, let's talk about, I won't spend too much time on this, but why am I teaching this class and why might that be relevant? Um, I've had a lot of different roles in my life. Um, I've had a lot of different careers in my life. From marketing, we've talked to, I've talked to you two down here about marketing. Uh, I was a marketing person uh, for a long time and I, I've never taken a marketing class, but I was one. Uh, I've been in a lot of stage companies from Microsoft large to like three people in a dormitory in Beijing uh, to, uh, you know, actually IPOs and all that other stuff. Uh, I've seen a lot, a lot of business plans. I've been in that unfortunate uh, percent that hasn't succeeded multiple times and been in the small percent that actually has uh, a few times. Um, I think these competitions are great. So I really, really encourage all of you to participate. Um, I believe in entrepreneurship, whether you're an actual entrepreneur who's starting a business or you just take that as an attitude in your life, in your job, if you see yourself as an entrepreneur, I think your likelihood of understanding that balance of risk and planning is going to, if you can manage that balance, you're gonna have more success. Uh, and. I really enjoyed the hell out of teaching this class because I learned new things from all of you. And I can tell you that some of the relationships that, and so through the competition, we've actually hired in one of my VCs two people who were winners of the competition, no promises. Um, but you know, there's a lot that can come from doing this uh, that have been very exciting. So I also wanna just do a small disclaimer. I'm gonna talk about a lot of concepts and ideas. Uh, many of them are not mine. Uh, alone. I'm a, a relentless plagiarist. I'm not encouraging you to do so yourselves in any papers for other classes. 
but I, there's several people I owe a lot to, uh, in sp specifically Rich Tong, Jonathan Robertson, Jerry Weissman, who were behind a lot of the ideas that I, I really espouse in this class. Uh, what's the outline for the class? So we're going to break this class into three core uh, buckets, okay? Uh, and you'll start to see some repeating themes here in a minute. Uh, by the way, I want to also sort of modus operandi, always interrupt, raise your hand, do not worry. This, I know there's a million people in this class, but participation is not just, uh, you know, desired, it's expected, okay? And so, and you can't hurt my feelings. Uh, I'm too old for that now, so go ahead. If you disagree with something I say, or I said something wrong, or you know, offensive. I'm old. I don't. I'm politically incorrect. I need to be trained and, and taught. So go for it. Okay. Um, but back, back to the course outline. So we're going to break the class into three sections. The first part is all about the product, um, which is really, you know, what is this thing that around which you're going to build a business? If you don't have something to sell, either a service or a product, you can't do anything. So how do you do that? The second one is great. Now I have this product. I'm going to build a plan that allows me to begin to have this become a business. And now I have to persuade people, lots of different kinds of people, to give me the things that I need in order to turn a product into something that's actually sustainable. So we're gonna do that in specific things. Part one, your inspiration. How do you go from a great idea to a vision and company purpose? Um, part two is gonna go and say, now I have this idea. How do I turn that idea into something that's a tangible, real product? Uh, and then we're going to move. So now I've got a real product. We're going to have guest speakers for both of those. Now I'm going to go and build a plan. First part of that is really doing your homework, understanding the world in which that product is going to have to live, where you're going to have to compete, who you're going to have to go after. So that's called, again, apologies for the sports analogy, but that's your playing field. Um, your play. Uh, it's funny, I did write a book called The Marketing Playbook, which these things are in, and I did make a false reference about football uh, in doing that. Uh, so again, forgive me. But you have to pick a strategy for how you're going to compete or how you're going to enter a market. You got to do that. We're going to spend time on that. Then you have to have a business model. I mean, some of these things we talked about, um, I'm sorry, you mentioned Kurt. So here's this great vision for, uh, you know, for WeWork. They have gargantuan amounts of money, uh, and yet had they, they didn't necessarily fully think about the business model that was going to support them. So you can have a great business, but if it actually is financially poorly structured, it's a fast way to lose money, lose power, lose face, uh, maybe even get murdered by the Yakuza. Um, so, uh, and, and then uh, if you take all that wonderful stuff and turn it into an actual plan that has time frames that will allow you to roll that out over time. Then you take all that and you got to take that on the road and convince people to give you things. Okay. That's called your pitch. The first part of that is my favorite thing. Uh, I'm just going to say is really figuring out the logic for your whole business so that the logic of your story, um, storytelling is a key part of whatever any of you do in your life for job interviews, for getting into college, you know, whatever it is, you got to have your story. You got to figure out the logic for that first. Then you actually have to turn that into a well-articulated presentation. This is a key, key part of winning any competition. There are lots and lots of businesses who have better products and fail because they're poorly articulated. Um, and then lastly, you have to build a company, okay? So you can have all those wonderful things, but then you have to run a company and you have to have things like lawyers and structures and an entity and all that. And we're going to figure out how that works. Through all that, we're going to refer to a couple core concepts um, that are, they're just going to make this simpler. And I'm just going to name them and you're going to hear them over and over again. One, when you're thinking about the products, there's something called the ABCs, which helps you kind of understand where things are in the marketplace. MVP is called, uh, well, I'm just going to ram through there. MVP is not the football thing. Um, again, sorry. Uh, three Cs. So when you're thinking about your plan and assessing this, there's something I call the three Cs. Many of you MBAs have all heard about SWOT analysis. Uh, I, try, I have my own flavor of that. Uh, and then when you're literally going to the next level and articulating this, there's some tools I have called the uh, XYZs, one, two, threes, and something called the WIFI. Um, I'm not gonna explain any of these because I wanna leave you all in suspense. Okay, so now that's kind of what's gonna happen, how we're gonna structure this. I'd like to talk a little bit about expectations, both 
uh, what you can expect, what, uh, what you expect, what you can expect from me and what I expect from you, okay? So interestingly, many of you filled out a survey. I'm gonna apologize because of the structure of the class this year, I couldn't put the first survey on Canvas, so I had to send it to an email. Some of you did not get to fill that survey out. Uh, you're gonna fail the class, I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> no, but so we'll take note that some of you were late registrants or whatever, and we'll, we'll compensate for that. But it was interesting anyway, because in looking at that, the answers to that survey, uh, I learned some interesting things about what you said about yourselves. Uh, so uh, you said that, and there was a whole list of things that you could rate yourselves in terms of your knowledge. Uh, and actually, most of you think you know something about business as a whole. And I can say that's pretty nice. That's great. I will find out whether that's true or not. 10% uh, of you actually are, think you're hot shit uh, on some topic or another. And we'll test and find out whether that's true or not. And if you are, I'd like to learn. Uh, and there's 4% there's of you who basically told the truth about not knowing anything. And I want to give you a hint. Humility is a weapon. Uh, use it. Uh, interestingly, though, like the things that people said they actually really did know about um, was uh, teams and leadership. So that was one of the, so that's really interesting. People, you know, felt like a very large number of people felt like they had some knowledge about how to be leaders, etc. It'll be interesting to find, as we get to know one another more, like how much of that is working inside a company versus a brand new company where you actually have to be the chief boss man or boss lady, which is a pretty different situation. Uh, and then 45% uh, of you, which is a lot of you, said you really don't have much experience with entrepreneurship. Hooray, because that's what this class is about. Okay, now what I'd like to do um, in the getting to know about one another for a moment, I would like each of you to introduce yourselves to your, the, your neighbors. So I'll pause, I've already introduced myself. I'm John, so please just say hi and introduce yourselves, say your names. Okay, the next thing I'd like you to do, I'd like you to tell your, pick one of your neighbors and share with each other why you're taking this class. I only want like five word answers, okay? Not long, remember the survey was just a few words. Okay. Okay, 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 good. So, this is what you all said in aggregate about why you're taking this class. So, 43% of you said, because you wanna learn something about business planning. So you actually read the title of the class and said, well, that makes sense. I guess it's a business planning class. Hooray for you. Uh, some of you want to have fun. Uh, it's kind of a huge drop off, by the way. Notice that. Like all of a sudden it's like, I want to do business planning. Good. I want to have fun and personal development. Like pfft, that's a pretty big difference. Um, what was interesting in networking, entrepreneurship, yay, inspiration and ideas. I hope you are able to inspire one another with ideas and, you know, inspire me. I won't steal them too directly. Um, but one of the things that's really, really fascinating to me is that uh, only 2% of you said you were interested, you, you were doing this because you want to learn about pitching. And only 1% more of you actually, more of you than said you wanted to do pitching, said your goal in this class was to pass. I mean, that's honestly kind of depressing. I, I, sorry, it's just like, wait a minute. That's your level of ambition? You want to pass? I mean, okay, it's fine, it's fine. But like in entrepreneurship, most entrepreneurs I, I meet are like, we want to win, we want to change the whole world. Passing is not usually, you know, this kind of spirit that you want to have. And secondly, uh, you, I'm sorry, if you don't want to learn how to pitch, you should probably not be here, okay? because you should probably not ever be an entrepreneur. 
because you may hate pitching. You may be the biggest introvert. And in fact, I've known many, right? Uh, by the way, my former boss, well, my boss's boss's boss, Bill Gates. I mean, the guy is a weirdo introvert, right? He had to learn how to do this in order to basically persuade everybody. So you're going to have to do that. And it's related to passing, okay? So, there, the, so that gets us back up to 6 5%. Um, but so I just wanted to comment. All This number has to move up, this pitching number. You're going to have to make it a goal. And if you do so, passing will be something all of you can do. So let's talk about what you can expect from me. Anybody know who this is? Uh, you said it. What's your name? Sarah? Okay. Sarah, you get a choice between uh, a, um, a uh, snickerdoodle or a vegan, uh, a vegan molasses cookie. Uh, yeah, all right. You get a snickerdoodle. All right. So what you can expect from me is a quote from him, which is, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. Uh, it might be a little overstatement. Uh, and cookies. Okay. So uh, this is how this also works. Uh, we have a participation kind of mode here. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm Catholic, and my wife is Jewish which means we have guilt and shame surrounding us <laughs> at all times, okay? So I'm going to use that, which is also not, this is not a safe place if you don't participate. Sorry, that was really bad. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> but if you don't participate, I'm going to call on you, right? And so there's sort of two paths. You can participate and get a cookie, right? Or... You cannot participate and get shame because I'm going to call on you, right? And I'm going I'm to make life painful if you don't, all right? And there's another thing, which is fill out your surveys. Because if you fill out your surveys, I will actually, in the next survey, which is a motivator for all of you, you get to tell me what kind of cookies you like. And maybe they won't be vegan molasses cookies and snickerdoodles, and I might consider bringing them instead. Okay, so that's cookies versus shame. Uh, in terms of the class, how's the class going to actually function and work? Uh, in class, please show up on time. I know some of you, if you're not going to show up on time, let me know. If you're going to miss the class, let me know. Send me an email. Some of you have classes that require you to march 100 miles to get over here. Um, come to the back, uh, but also kind of generally let me know. Uh, bring your name cards, please. Uh, I, I, I'm very, very, very lousy with names, uh, and I forget them. Uh, we're going to uh, use time at the beginning of class. So teams are a big part of this. And people are going to recruit for their teams, right? Uh, you have an opportunity to come after this class, every single class, and come in front and give a very short pitch to try to recruit people. And it serves two functions. One, it gives you an opportunity to practice your pitching. And two, it gives you a chance to recruit people. We're going to have lots of things to recruit people. Um, we're going to have numerous guest speakers, so please be attentive and participate. Or, again, expect to be called upon. Uh, if you can't, again, if you can't attend, email me. Uh, I will send out an email after every class, and that will include a link to the video of this class. It's being uh, videoed, and will also include uh, the, um, the PowerPoints from this class. You can make up a few of the classes that you've missed by watching the video and reading the slides and email me, emailing me and demonstrating to me through questions and comments that you actually did do so. Um, if you don't show up for class, this is a participate patient class. If you don't show up, you should just drop the class. If you anticipate missing a lot of classes, it's just not worth it, right? Um, it's not one of these sort of write it in things. Um, outside of class, I will have office hours. Uh, there's Dempsey 111. I'm generally there 4.15 or so every Tuesday before this class. And I'll, be, I'll sit there until I walk over here and get this started. Uh, if uh, you want to make sure that I'm going to be there or secure your slot, email me. Uh, that's my email address. Uh, I'm pretty good on email usually, but I, I have like three other jobs. So sometimes it will take me 24 hours to respond. Uh, I try to have pretty much everything on Canvas. Outside of class, there's also going to be uh, a couple of things that we're going to do. Uh, one, this pitching thing is super important. So I'm going to have two pitch workshops 
they're entirely voluntary. Um, we will schedule them and you can come. If you have an idea, we will uh, work on your pitches for you. I'll give you a little training and work on your pitches with you. And then we're gonna have one workshop on this very topic of, okay, so you have all this, how do you create the sort of financials behind this? Uh, and both myself and some others uh, will have at least one out of class workshop to help those who are, are going down the pike on that. I wanna make a sort of public service announcement. I know we have numerous MBAs here and we have lots of different students from, we, we have a very wide range of uh, student majors and levels and interests and exposure to business as a whole. This is not an extremely deep marketing class. It is not an academic finance class. I am not those people, right? And nor are my guests. This is a practicum with real people coming in talking about real stuff and doing it at a relatively fast pace across the full range. So if you're looking for a deep finance class or a deep class in any one of those other subjects, please go to the course catalog, um, but don't expect that here, okay? We'll do what we can, but it is, I mean, maybe it's not a mile wide and an inch deep, maybe it's two inches deep and a mile wide. Uh, okay, uh, how, how does this kind of, what, what do you have to do? Uh, there are weekly assignments. Uh, those assignments are very simple, right? This is not a class where I'm trying to like make you read lots of textbooks and spit back things with big tests and all that. It's really about you doing the work of trying to figure out how to do a business. Um, I have these surveys which are meant to be fun. There's no wrong or right answers to them, but they do help inform some things. Um, they're posted right after each class um, and they will now, from now on, all be on Canvas. Do them quickly. We need your answers because we will use your answers in the following class. Um, there's a reading list. There's, uh, by the way, and if you have readings that you think would be interesting, share them with me and I can, I'll read them and then see if we should share them with the rest of the team, the rest of the class. They're all on Canvas. Um, there's a lot to pick from. Some are, I really recommend uh, and some are optional. Uh, and again, I really uh, want you to do this shame versus uh, cookies. Uh, teams, startups are teams. Uh, I really don't know of a single startup that is run, founded, operated, etc., that's successful by just one person. Um, so teams, people are, you know, don't have every skill. So uh, it's really important that you have that. Um, the non-quiz assignments. So those assignments where you actually have to submit something around a business, those will be graded as teams in total. Um, I'm gonna leave it to the team to have the honor system about making sure everybody on the team actually pulls their weight. Um, uh, you have to be on a team. It's between three and five members. Uh, there are some exceptions if you have a good reason like, oh, I have an unbelievably super secret military project that I can't tell anybody else who doesn't have a security clearance on. Okay, uh, but other than that, not so sure. Um, I already mentioned pitch your teams and you know, to recruit. Um, we're going, uh, if you don't have, if your team can't come up with a new idea, make one up, right? Borrow one that already exists. I, I teach a class for, uh, I just taught something uh, around this with the Renewer Scholar High School kids, and I had one kid uh, come up with a plan for um, uh, Crocs. Uh, and he had a great pitch because it was all about how Crocs help you get chicks. Um, <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, we really need you to form teams by the end of the first month. Uh, we're actually gonna have something uh, next week. Um, at the end of this class, we're gonna have uh, alcoholic beverages and food called, and non-alcoholic beverages, sorry, yes, uh, not just water. Um, and, and we're gonna have food, which is not pizza. From Lumpia World. Lumpia World, okay, so good food for you to mingle and help make your teams. Um, and. Alec, raise your hand, stand up. Uh, Alec is one of our graders. He is helping to, uh, there's a sheet already sent out to you, which is a way to help you either declare what you want in a team or join a team, etc. cetera. Maybe uh, later he can talk to you about how to make that happen, but we're gonna keep relying on that so that we get real teams. Uh, uh, and I'm gonna send out an email to remind you about that uh, shortly. There's some key dates. Uh, next week, there's gonna be a, a panel of former competitors uh, and participants in this class. Uh, and then we'll have that little party after the class. Um, you need to pick your idea, team, et cetera, before the end of the month. Um, there's, uh, a, you know, we have this business plan template, which is just please write out, like fill out the stuff that needs to be filled out there. 
there's a couple opportunities for you to send me drafts and we will read those drafts and give you comments. It's optional, um, but it's helpful. And the same is true for PowerPoints, um, the, the, the pitches. Um, I wanna highlight, I wanna mention something to all of you. Please do not send me, please, 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 please do not send me PDFs, okay? Because I want to write and edit and put in comments in your documents and doing so on a PDF is a big pain in the neck, okay? Uh, so just for your benefit, you'll get better comments and help if you don't send me a PDF, you send me normal files. Um, in the end, we'll have a final business plan uh, thing and then at the very end, we will have our own pitch session and uh, near the very end, we'll have a pitch session and contest with prizes, uh, so get ready. Uh, okay. So that's, before I move on, I just wanna ask any questions about how the class is going to operate, um, you know, what's expected of you in the class, what the schedule looks like, any of that stuff. Yes, I cannot read your name at all. Okay, I need glasses, but it's not your fault. Yes. So uh, for, for the reading assignments, you posted a, for the, especially for the first one. Yeah. Okay, so the question was, uh, I posted a lot of resources uh, in the reading list, okay? And is it worth going through all of them? Absolutely, okay? <laughs> of course it's worth reading everything, but you don't have to read all of it. There's some notes on there that say, look, these are things that I consider required, and there's others that are optional. They're all pretty short, by the way, so this is not a big deal, but I would just focus on the things that are, and there, there's a set of them for each week, so I would focus on the ones that uh, say required, because <laughs> that's meant to be required. Uh, and then uh, just uh, if you have time, uh, it's to your benefit to read some of the other things. Some of them are funny, some of them are you know, short. Again, none of this is academic. I, there's not a single academic reading in any of that reading list, uh, not to cast aspersions on the uh, academy. Um, any other questions? Yes? What's the prize for the, uh, or what are the prize for the pitch competition? You will find out next week. Oh, that, sorry, the question was, what's the prize uh, for the competition? And the answer is you'll find out next week. I'm giving you a preview tip, which is when you're doing Q&A, repeat the question. And I failed at that, and I fixed it, okay. Okay, I am now, it's my great pleasure to introduce Sarah, who is the assistant director of the Burke Center, which is the throbbing, beating heart of entrepreneurship uh, at the University of Washington, and one of the most important things that's putting the University of Washington Business School on the map. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I can click, I just need to attach first. Um, Ambika, I saw that you just walked in. Hi, I wanna thank you for my outfit today. I'm loving the armoire service. <laughs> All right, um, all right, so hopefully most of you are familiar with the Burke Center for Entrepreneurship, um, but in case you're not, I'm here to tell you about it and specifically to tell you about the Dempsey Startup Competition, the resources that we can offer you so that you are successful in the competition and what success could actually look like. Um, first of all, this is me, I'm Sarah Studer. Uh, you may know me from talking and tabling at different events all around campus, that's what I look like when I'm doing that. Um, I'm super passionate about civic engagement and voting, so much so that I was actually created into a work of art, so you may see that, like, wallpapered all over the place around town sometimes. Uh, and you can ask me about ad codes. I know there's quite a few people in here that are um, registering a little bit late, so if you still need an ad code, come and talk to me. Um, I am also a wealth of knowledge about resources for students, many of which I will cover in these slides. I can also help you with mentor connections. Uh, I can help you with uh, which events that you should attend, not just here on campus, but in the greater Seattle community. And of course, I am a wealth of knowledge on all things Dempsey Startup Competition. And for those of you who actually want to build a company and go for it after you go through your student experience, I can tell you about the Jones and Foster Accelerator Program, which I will not touch on too much today, um, but you can come and find me at any point. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Burke Center for Entrepreneurship is housed here in the Foster School of Business, but what I think is the most interesting part, and part of the reason that I'm part of the Burke Center, is that we're interdisciplinary. We're for students across campus, across discipline. There are so many different majors uh, represented in this room. We'll talk a little bit more about 
a little bit more about that next week. Um, but as John said, forming a team, why are these auto advancing? <laughs> Um, the forming a team is one of the most important things and we know that not just business students have great ideas it's everyone uh, we have about 2,000 students that enroll in courses through the Burke Center we have about 500 students across the region that enter our competitions uh, we have 600 judges and mentors that uh, actually judge and evaluate uh, business plans through our competitions we award over $300,000 each year to students and to startups um, and those 1,000 plus startups that we have helped launch have actually raised over $400 million. And some of those startups, this is like logo soup behind me. You may see some that you know, you may see some that you don't know. It needs a little bit of an update. A couple of these don't exist anymore. Uh, but some that you may have seen in the news recently, this is all from the last year, uh, if not six months. A Alpha Bio raising $2.8 million. That's a UW spin out as well as Membrion. Quite a few of you are familiar with Sugar and Spoon, the cookie dough company that now has a little brick and mortar shop on the Ave. Dogs love dough. Uh, Joe Chocolates uh, has created a caffeinated chocolate uh, featured up here. It's a gift for our speaker. Uh, they have a storefront in the Pike Place Market. After um, many years of using the resources and mentors and the accelerator program and going through the competition, they have a brick and mortar in Pike Place. It's amazing. Uh, Otomo Coffee went through the business plan competitions uh, and has now uh, raised $2.6 million to make a coffee that is not made out of coffee beans. So I'll let you think about that one. Uh, Impel Neuropharma is delivering drugs through your nose. Uh, and Strideline, you may be familiar with the sock guys. They have created an incredible sock company that has uh, now inked to deal with the NFL. So that is just some of the teams that we have worked with and some of the highlights that you may see. But I'm here to talk to you about the competition and why you should enter it. So we have five main reasons why. You can make serious progress on your idea. Ooh, I have to turn around, it's a huge screen. Uh, you're gonna gain valuable experience from industry leaders and expertise. You can build your network, most important. Uh, creating a tangible product that you can show off and of course, Last but not least, you can also win prize money. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the picture behind me right now is what looks like what it looks like when you make it to the investment round of the Dempsey Startup Competition. That is 300 judges waiting to go to your trade show style booths to hear about your idea. You are pitching them to get their investment dollars through the competition. The top 16 teams that make it through that go on in the competition. I'll talk about that. The feedback that you can get on your plan from industry experts and professionals is unmatched. I mean, if there's, if you have like the, what you think is the worst idea and you just want to get feedback on it, you'll get feedback from 20 to 30 people on what you could do to bring it back maybe the next year and see it go through the competition. Building your network, of course, extremely important always. It's all about who you know. And you get to build a prototype. You actually get to show people what it is or what it could be. So this is actually Joe Chocolates way before they were in that brand, um, in that packaging over there, and way before they had a uh, brick and mortar. Um, and again, the prize money, always an incentive. The greatest thing about prize money, in my mind, is that it goes directly to you as a student. So you can go on vacation, you can pay tuition, you can do whatever you want with this money if you win. Um, but I will say, and I will emphasize this always, you need to make sure that you're talking to your team about how you're gonna split that prize money up. So talk about that in advance because I have dealt with quite a few teams that don't, and it's a really messy process if you feel like someone hasn't pulled their weight and therefore don't deserve enough money. I can't weigh in on that, that is up to you. So you're gonna have to be adults and figure it out. No, we work. <laughs> there you go. Uh, in addition to the Dempsey startup, which is my area of expertise, we do have two additional uh, innovation challenges. Information is behind me. Information is also going to be on a flyer that is left at the top of each staircase, um, and I can distribute that through Canvas too if you're interested. Um, but if you have an idea for improving, improving our healthcare system, um, you should enter the HIC. Deadline's coming up in February. Uh, if you have an idea that will help save our planet, Please, please, please <laughs> tell us about it. Enter the um, Environmental Innovation Challenge mid-February deadline for a, uh, let's see, April 2nd competition date. Uh, and then, of course, the Dempsey Startup Competition. The first two challenges that I mentioned are just two-stage competitions. The Dempsey Startup is a five-round competition, which I will tell you more about now. 
Last year, we received 113 applications from around the region. Our competitions are not just open to UW students, they are open to students all around the region. Uh, 113 of them, I oh, don't understand what this PowerPoint is doing. Uh, 113 students from, or teams from 16 schools, that's 271 students, which is pretty incredible. We had 406 judges evaluate plans and uh, 35 company sponsors and we awarded $80,000. The first round is a screening round. So you submit your five to seven page business plan. It's reviewed online by between 10 and 20 judges who are offering you written feedback. The top 36 teams from there advance to the live investment round where you saw that Joe chocolate in its old packaging. Uh, the investment round is the top 36 teams. Each judge gets 36 Burke bucks, or sorry, 1,000 Burke bucks to spend on a portfolio of up to five companies. Uh, at the end, the teams with the most investment dollars there, Sweet 16 teams advance. The coaching round is our non-elimination round, but that is where you employ everything that John has taught you through the pitch um, workshops as well as through this class, and you offer a 15-minute pitch with a five-minute Q&A. And the Sweet 16 is, again, re-delivering that pitch, which is hopefully improved, uh, submitting a full business plan, and then presenting to a panel of seven judges from which the final four, ugh, final four, move forward. Um, the most exciting part in my mind uh, about the competition is that we have a very fun dinner at the end where we award prize money. Um, we have a keynote speaker, which is gonna be amazing. Um, we award up to $80,000, so that's not just the top four prizes. We have a variety of special prizes that we also award. So even if you're not gonna go for the $25,000 grand prize, there could be you could be going for the best consumer product idea. You could go for the social impact prize. There's a variety of different prizes which will be posted up on our website as soon as the application date opens. Um, but the top 36 teams who exhibited at the investment round are eligible for those prizes. Uh, so even if you don't make it all, to, all the way to the final four, there's still a great chance that you'll win prize money. So how can you be successful <laughs> in this competition? I have six ways here, but there's probably more like 10 to 20. Uh, you can attend an upcoming event. The slide's probably gonna advance without me, like it just did. Uh, but attend an upcoming event. Um, there's one that's tomorrow. Uh, you can apply for prototype funding. If you have an idea in the health and environmental innovation spaces, you can actually, we will fund you uh, to work on that idea and bring it to the challenge. Uh, you can add your profile to Startup Tree. That's an online resource where you can um, connect with other students that might want to work on your project with you. You can review what successful business plans look like. We have a variety of examples in the Burke Center's office. You may not leave the office with those plans. You must sit in our office uh, and read them, but you can come and take a look at what is included. Uh, you can sign up for 30-minute office hour sessions with our um, MBA students um, or with entrepreneurs. We'll have more information about that. Um, or you can, and I think this is my favorite, you can schedule a meeting with the foster school librarians, which you will hear from the head librarian in one of these classes, but uh, Google is not a research tool. You need to dive in to find out what consumer trends look like, what market reports look like, and there are tons of resources within Foster that can help you with that, so we'll get that to that in, I think, week three of this class. Uh, upcoming events, there's a lunch. Uh, that's next, that's tomorrow, so you're welcome to join us. It's at the Hub. There's the Legal Issues for Startup Workshop, so if you feel like you have an idea that is ugh, oh so important and you can't tell anyone about it, uh, please come and talk to some lawyers about what that actually means and learn how to actually talk about your idea without giving away any of your secret sauce. Um, we'll have office hours with attorneys. We have a networking night that's part of this class, so I won't touch on that. Um, and then for those of you who are thinking about launching a consumer product, we're going to have a consumer product weekend event, um, which will allow you to work directly with some people who have actually created products and brought them to market uh, here in Seattle, whether that's food, uh, apparel, you kind of name it. We're going to try and have as many different resources and people that we can. Um, Burke Center offers drop-in office hours on Wednesday, so you can come and talk to me and my colleagues. Uh, we have BYOB, Build Your Own Business for Undergraduate Students Only, on Thursdays. Uh, and on Fridays, the co-motion at the University of Washington offers a fundamental for startups uh, session. And so if you want to dive a little bit deeper in one hour um, on different specific issue areas, you're going to want to check that all out. And all of that comes out in our weekly newsletter, which you should all start receiving because now you are in this class. I saw a question. Yes, yes, everything will be shared. It will be part of John's PowerPoints. You can scroll on through.
By the way, I didn't ask you if you wanted a cookie. Because <laughs> you participated. Do you want a cookie? I also think uh, Kurt needs a cookie. Uh, Kurt earned a cookie too. Yeah, I, yeah, I know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, what kind? Vegan molasses or snickerdoodle? Which is basically a sugar cookie. Snickerdoodle. Well, I ate snickerdoodle. And you, you, you want one? Oh, you, you don't. All right, that's fine. I'll eat. All right, sorry to interrupt. No, it's fine. <laughs> Uh, so what does success look like? I'm actually going to do quick two things. Um, I can't do this whole process alone. I cannot run this competition without my co-chairs, um, who I would like to just invite to stand up and do a quick introduction of themselves. Um, Ruchi, if you'd like to go first. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Ruchi Singh, and I'm a, a full-time MBA student. I'm a second year. Um, prior to coming to business school, I uh, was part of a legal tech startup, which I sold to a PE firm, and then came to my MBA program. Happy to be here and excited to meet you all. Hi guys, I'm Roshni. I'm a first year MBA, full-time student here at the Foster Business School. Um, prior to uh, my MBA program, I worked in the telecom and tech industry. I really look forward to meeting a lot of you as you can take our competition. Uh, so these two are helping me to organize this entire competition. If you have questions, you can always ask me. You can also ask them. They will be a great resource uh, throughout the competition. Um, and I'd also like to introduce our director, Amy Salen, who's sitting over here. Um, she can talk a little bit about what success looks like with some of these teams, if you would like. <laughs> <laughs> I'll click for you. Okay. okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy. It's awesome to see you all here and awesome to have Sarah here. She just started with us and, and took over in this role a year ago, December. Happiest month of my life and absolutely the best year. She absolutely rocks. Um, so I highly recommend stopping by our office, getting to know her. John, as well, has been teaching this class now for five, four, four years. And it's just been absolutely amazing. So this whole process with the competition is such a cool way to learn about how to be an entrepreneur, test your ideas, get a network, as Sarah said. These two ladies were actually seniors at Washington State University, and they came up with a capstone project, and as part of their capstone, they had to enter a business plan competition. So they, as they did research, found that um, in developing countries where they were giving children vaccines, one in 10 people died from contaminated needles because what often happened was the needles would get reused. So here you are protecting your children from disease only to have them die because of an infected needle. They were horrified by this stat, decided to come up with a way to help that, um, and came up with a cap to go on vaccine bottles that sterilized the needle um, when it came back out again. They called this Engage. They won their Washington State University business plan competition, got great feedback from their judges there, and were encouraged to enter our competition. They not only won the Health Innovation Challenge the very first year, uh, went into our business plan competition, placed in the top four, and then went on to our accelerator program, which you'll hear more about moving on. But that's the program that we have that really helps you go from being a student team to a startup company. They worked for six months with mentors. They learned what they were doing. They got to um, spend more time researching, worked with mentors, and got $25,000 at the end of that process to keep their business going. And the key with all of these teams that I'm gonna talk about is they all practiced as much as they could. They pitched as much as they could. Um, and you two, awesome pitches, by the way, very impressive. <laughs> But you know, they really, taking advantage of every opportunity the university offers you is something I cannot recommend strongly enough. So don't just do you know, one thing, do two, do three. Take advantage of all the workshops that our team sets up, that Comotion offers, because this is all free advice. This is the golden ticket, if you wanna go back to that Charlie and the Chocolate Factory reference. 
that there are so many people who will help you make progress, who will give you honest feedback, who will point you in the right direction, give words of wisdom, whether you want to hear it or not. Um, take advantage of all of this while you can. Because, you know, there's tons of people who will help you when you graduate, but at that point, you probably have to pay for a lot of that. So, you know, really love being UW students right now and, and get, to, get to know everything you can. Um, so other teams talk about taking advantage of stuff. Multimodal health, VHAB was a, um, uh, uh, ro what's the word I'm looking for? Robotic. Yeah, well, it wasn't robotic hand. It was, um, it was doing, therapy. yeah, it was doing therapy using computers and virtual reality is what I was groping for, sorry. But they went through the Science and Technology Showcase, and you were going to um, see some of these teams in just a couple weeks as part of our networking night. They went into, as you can see, the business plan competition in 2014, 2015, and 2016. So if you're working on an idea, keep entering. As long as you're a student, you can enter the competition. Our one caveat is that once you win one of the big checks, you're, you're done in that competition. Because we figure you've made you know, great progress and now it's time to move on to your, to your next phase. But they, in 2014, they did not make it to the investment round. I think they were runners up. In 2015, they made it to the investment round. And in 2016, they made it to the Sweet 16. And then they went on into the accelerator and again, made some amazing progress working with great mentors. And then, um, and we've changed the rules a little bit. We started the Health Innovation Challenge in 2016, and so for their final hurrah, they entered the Health Innovation Challenge and got more feedback from actually a different group of judges who were in that space. They then went off and went into Comotion's VR AR labs and lived there for quite a number of years while they were still working on this product. Um, another one who was an overachiever who just kept coming back and really worked the system to you know, learn. And that the key with going through all of these things, like the Science Technology Showcase two years and the Business Plan Competition, is that they're making progress. So it's not just coming back in the same place year after year, but he's made progress. And he was pulling stem cells out of urine in order to bank them knowing that in 20 years the technology is going to be there so when you need to grow a new kidney in 20 years you can use your own stem cells that he has banked for you um, and so he um, and he was working out of his own lab in his garage this wasn't even his phd work this is what he was doing for fun um, but they knew that they were going to each time make that progress, get feedback on where they were, use that feedback to make more progress, and come back in to you know, go through this loop again. Um, so he's still out there. It's now called Silene Biotech, I believe. And you know, he's pivoted quite a bit based on all of this feedback and what the market is looking for. Thank you. Um, and then last, this is a company that was decaf style in the moment, is now decafino, and he's now, several years later, finally actually launching his product. He was a um, chem E major undergrad who figured out how to take caffeine out of beverages and still keep the taste. So he came up with like a tea bag full of a product that if you dropped it into your Coke or your tea or your coffee would pull out the caffeine and you'd still have a great tasting beverage. So he continued that work. It was a, a kind of environmental impact. So he went into the EIC, went into the business plan competition, um, went into the accelerator, and I think that date's wrong. He actually went on a normal trajectory. But after that, he continued to work on it, got feedback from the network he had built, and he finally reached the point in the product, because he still had to work on that whole taste problem, um, that he is now launching the product, and Decafino is out there for five years later. So this is all great, and what we really want is for you to be inspired. Take your ideas, whether it's a capstone project or a passion project or you know something that's been kind of tweaking around in your brain through a class assignment, and explore it. You know, all those things that you've maybe you know you don't keep a dream diary, but you keep a great idea diary. You know, play with them and get feedback. And if it doesn't work, throw it out and start anew and come back next year. I've seen um, undergrads who have gone through four years in a row with four different teams. Just 
I want to get it. I want to see what's going on. I want to learn and I'm going to do it again this year. And now I have an idea. And by the time their seniors have really come up with something they're passionate about, like Joe Chocolate, and now this is what they're doing as they move on into their life. So any questions I can answer before I turn it back to John or Sarah? All right, come by our office. We're in Dempsey 227. Our whole team would love to talk to you about what we do and what we can help you with. So just a quick note on that. Do come by our office, and if you happen to need an idea, I have a huge post-it note next to my desk of all these different products that I personally need. Uh, so <laughs> if you yes. would like to take any of those on, I would uh, very much appreciate it. The challenges that I experience in my own life. So thanks, everybody. So thank you, Sarah and Amy. I'm just going to reiterate how I think it's a unique opportunity for you not just to think in the abstract about these products or in the abstract about entrepreneurship, but actually try to put it to the test. And that's a good segue to the real deal, which is somebody who's done exactly that. Uh, it is a real pleasure and honor uh, to introduce Ambika Singh. Just a few words. Her service, Amwar, is something that all of you should try. It is unique. Uh, Sarah's uh, a living example of using that. Uh, it's something that can actually, in an everyday way, change your life. Uh, the other thing I think is great is Ambika, uh, you know, is much closer to your experience than I am because uh, she's a lot younger than I am. But she also has done some of this and been in your seat in the past, of course, in a different school, which is you know the enemy. But uh, she really just a really really great uh, to have her here and to share her own experiences from start to finish, uh, from start to ongoing as, uh, as the CEO and chief boss lady of Armour. So uh, thank you uh, very much, Ambika. And do you want me to click slides for you or? Uh, sure. Well, All right. Either way, it's easy for me to get over there. Here, you wanna? Oh, great, thank you. Do you want me to take that for you? Um, so I remember to bring swag this oh, time. Yeah, swag. All right. I'll just put it <laughs> Information. <over there. laughs> um, yes. yes, I know. Last time I didn't learn. Can you, All right. can you hear me? Can people hear her? Hi. Yes? Yes. All right. Well, thank you for that super kind introduction. Um, and as John said, it is uh, a pleasure for me to be here because I was very recently in your shoes. Um, and it's it, it, a, a bit of a whoa, how did I get here type moment every time I walk back into a classroom like this because I started Armoire sitting in your seat um, just over three years ago and uh, it feels like yesterday. So my goal today is to tell you a little bit about what that journey looked like and particularly focus on how I got from this seat to this seat um, because probably like the, the uh, very similarly to a lot of you guys, I had tons of ideas. Um, I had a job offer at a major consulting firm, and so there were lots of sort of like natural kind of um, conflicts uh, between getting from this seat to this seat. And so I'll give you a very personal view into one person's um, version of the journey, and uh, I would love to take questions about whatever you guys are particularly interested in. So, um, armoire, and before I go there, so. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the business to hopefully earn the right to give you these nuggets of wisdom um, as hopefully they will be for you. But these are the three things that I'll focus on. Um, one, how did I sort of reverse natural inertia um, and not kind of go down a path that maybe had a little bit more of goalposts and a path and uh, milestones and, that, and instead choose this kind of more unstructured uh, version of the next phase of my life. Secondly, um, what was the secret between taking the, uh, the idea from idea to business? And I'll focus a little bit on how we started to sell things and how important I think that is. Um, and the last thing, and this is something that John really helped me understand about myself really and about armoire, um, is like how do you translate that kind of uh, catchphrase of passion. We talk about that a lot in the startup space. So what are you passionate about? What do you love? Um, why does that matter? And what does that do for businesses? And why is it something that is so critical for you as a founder, but also for the people that you hire and the business that you choose to run? 
Uh, so those are the three things that I'll try to focus on. And if you give me a slide, before I get there, I'll tell you a little bit about Armoire. So what is the problem that we're trying to solve? At Armoire, we believe at this sort of phase of retail and apparel that the, one of the biggest problems facing the consumer is the paradox of choice. So if you imagine what retail looked like 25 years ago, there wasn't the ability to buy anything from anywhere and have it show up at your feet. Amazing, but also incredibly overwhelming. Um, there's the phenomena of buy and return. There is the proliferation of uh, brick and mortar plus e-commerce plus all these different kind of models. Are we buying things that are used? Are we sharing? What are the environmental impacts of what we're doing, et cetera, et cetera. And so our contention at Armoire is that sort of overwhelmingness of choice is really the next frontier that retail companies are going to have to solve for their consumers in order to earn their loyalty. So in br the broadest terms, that's really the problem that we're trying to solve. So how are we solving this? We are building the most personalized version of retail um, that the industry has ever seen. And so our guiding light and what we're building into is the ability for us to really know and understand our customers. Um, so we track everything that they do with us. Um, scary, scary. <laughs> and, and use it for good. Um, we are building into the ability to talk to them in a way that's really real and genuine. So uh, when we start to get to know them very much like you do with a normal human relationship, you don't learn everything about a person when you meet them on day one. Very similarly, that's how we think about our customers and our members. We earn the right to get to know them better, just as you would a friend or a trusted advisor or a personal stylist by adding value back into the relationship. And so what we think of as the guiding light on what we're building into from our Mars perspective is like we are building the relationship with the consumer, our members as the way we think about it, um, that she has with her best friend or her most trusted advisor in whatever sphere that looks like. And so that requires that we understand her. It requires that we have a paradigm that has a lot of trust in it so that she wants to give us more information and we continue to uh, kind of turn that loop of value um, so that just like a friendship, we can learn more and more about her. So um, why does this really matter? It matters because of the fact that w once we are able to develop that relationship, it's something that can add more value back to her than any other sort of like non-personalized um, service. And a key component of how this works tactically is that instead of just selling clothes to our consumers, we rent our clothes. So everything that I'm wearing, everything that Sarah's wearing, starts as a rental piece. And that's really important because the volume of data that we get is very different than it would be if we were selling clothes to people. So the way that the service works from a consumer's perspective is that she logs on to our subscription. So it's like Netflix of old, if anyone remembers DVDs. You guys are also younger than me, so I don't know if that is uh, the case. Um, but it's like net Netflix of old, where you get four pieces at a time, and you rotate them as many times as you want. So for a normal kind of purchase model, um, so one of our largest competitors is Stitch Fix on the purchase side. For those of you who are familiar, they will sell about $400 worth of clothing to their, competitor, to their customers in a year, which means anywhere between five and six items. We will send, on average, a customer 120 items over the span of the year, and we will show her thousands. And so our ability to learn what her um, preferences look like just grows exponentially. So that's really the crux of like what we have done from a model perspective that allows us to build into this vision of being the most personalized version of retail. Um, one of the reasons that we sort of talk about the personalization as the real um, end goal versus the rental as the real end goal is because we believe that in this evolution of what our company will start with and what it will end up with, there'll be many kind of like different frontiers that. Uh, we approach over time, but if we stay focused on the fact that our goal is to know you the best and be the best trusted advisor and be your best friend, rental or brick and mortar or 
personal styling or driving things to your van or sharing stuff, all of those things are different versions of how we'll deliver this personalized service, but anchoring it on who is she, what does she do, and what does our relationship look like with her allows us to be agile across whatever those new kind of frontiers look like um, as the company evolves. So um, the last piece about the company that I wanted to highlight to you guys. So what was the problem? What's our solution? And why does this really work? Um, so the reason that this really works, and you guys are also, a lot of you are MBAs, I think. All of you are MBAs? No. Low, well, some. A small percent. Well, so, some percentage of them are MBAs. OK, so OK. Some <laughs> unknown percentage. By the way, all of you are supposed to stay, a little, all you MBA people, you're supposed to stay after class for a few minutes. Ah. Please, thank you. <laughs> So when I was an MBA, so flywheels were such a buzzy term that I swore that I would never put one on a slide. I'm like, here we go. <laughs> um, because it, yes, it, it is great to figure out like how, essentially to me, what a flywheel means is that the more you build, you get some exponential lift on your business. And that's amazing. And like, of course, the concept is beautiful. But every business does not lend itself to a flywheel. Um, I actually love the Joe's chocolate guys. Um, I, I don't know that that business lends itself really to a flywheel um, in the same way that, say, like a viral content business does. But at least when I was an MBA, every business had a flywheel. Um, and it's actually taken us a while to figure out what our flywheel looks like um, and why it matters and do we have one. But this really, as I start to understand more and more about what we're building and why it's important, um, this has become sort of like core uh, a core part of the value that we know now that we're building into. And so what this means for us is like the solution is magical because the more customers that we acquire, it actually adds value back into customer one as well into as well into customer n plus one. Because we've learned more about the first customer through the last customer. And that wasn't clear to me in the beginning that that thing was actually going to add value all the way through. We can buy better. We can recommend better. She shares more with us that helps us learn about uh, people that look like her, people that don't look like her, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, this is now sort of like the magic behind why the business model for us is going to continue to be exponentially more valuable to the first customer than it was um, before we had N plus one. So um, where is the business today? Uh, so three, just over three years in, um, last year we did about uh, just over $3 million in revenue. We did um, a 4X increase on MRR between January and December. Um, other interesting What's metrics. MRR? Oh, good question. Um, uh, monthly <laughs> recurring revenue. <Sure. laughs> no, that's good, that's good. Um, and the, there's other interesting metrics are the fact that we've got a good kind of organic uh, acquisition channel. So we'll do about 35% of our customer acquisition through non-paid channels. Um, when we started, it was 100%. So we look at that number and protect it like all <laughs> with all of our energy because it's super important to be able to know that your business has an organic growth path, not just a, a paid growth path. So those are a couple of like the interesting nuggets about like where the business has ended up. Um, but it looks really pretty on the chart. Um, as you guys can imagine, there's a lot of like blood, sweat, and tears behind that. Yes? Oh my god. Where do we begin? <laughs> so uh, an interesting thing, I came from a software background, so I've never worked in a business that had physical goods before, um, and certainly not one that is based in physical goods. So forexing uh, the business this year meant that we also forex the carrying inventory, we forexed our warehouse space, we forexed the number of people that worked at the company. Um, and so all of that is a challenge. I mean, there was a time in the summer where we were hiring one to two people every week. So you could imagine that that was like, I mean, we didn't have any of the tools to know how to do that. The, the only way I knew how to hire before that was like hire someone that I had known for like five plus years. So <laughs> there, weren't, there weren't enough people that I'd known for five plus years to hire a new person every week. So. Um, I think that some of the, the biggest things, if I try to distill it, is that um, we, 
we try to build everything as flexibly as possible. Everything from where the warehouse was and where our office was. We, John and I know uh, the place where our first office was very well. So we started in a co-working space, which is an amazing example of like how we kind of tried to uh, flex through some of these moments. We started with um, a rack, literally a rack of clothing with 20 items on it. That was the beginning of the business. By the time we moved out of that co-working space, we had 25,000 items. And so the ability to sort of like flex into different spaces was like one way that we tried to hurdle that. Um, but it was, it was a challenge. Um, and now there's all sorts of like interesting other challenges that we're gonna see fall out of that. Um, we acquired a whole different group of customers that look completely different than our um, early group of customers. So like when we look at their behavior, they behave differently. So when we were building a solution for customer group A, uh, we continued to build from like a tech roadmap perspective, from an inventory perspective for that early group of customers. But the new group of customers is much larger than the early group of customers. So like figuring out how you navigate um, the loyal sort of like the people who built with you, who have spent a lot of money with you, who have good, there's a good indication they're gonna continue to spend a lot of money with you. Do you continue to build for them or do you start to build for this new group? Can you build for both, et cetera? Let me get back to that one because that's, that is a great question. Um, inventory management and specifically like, so we built a custom inventory management system. The warehouse of course like continues to improve in terms of like how we use technology and people and process. But there, the inventory question is um, specifically interesting because I'll tell you about uh, an insight that we had to rethink because of this kind of like hyper growth mode. Yes. How are you able to get the uh, customers to trust you with their data and their it's a great question. I mean, we, every time we deliver to them, we better add enough value that they not only want to spend their money with us, but they also want to spend or they want to share their information with us. So tactically, the way it works is that for our customers to return things to us and get new things, they give us information on the stuff that they had already. And so if you really blew it and it's her first case, she's probably not going to give you any information and she's not going to pay you again. So our ability to turn that um, happens at every touch point where it's got to be the value exchange has to make sense for the customer. Yeah. Just a couple quick questions. Um, I'm familiar with some other similar services like Runway, Runway. So could you describe maybe the most salient points of what differentiated your business model? And then um, are you considering expanding so let me take the second one first, because this I think is like a really important um, thing that I learned in school, which was to try to do one thing and do it super well. And this business, in by definition, breaks that <laughs> that hope um, apart because we are concurrently running a technology business, a consumer facing business, an inventory management business, the best marketing business ever, et cetera, because you can go, I'm the biggest dry cleaner in Seattle. So th there's a lot of problems with like trying to do one thing and do it well. So in terms of like adjacent customer segments, the backbone of what we're building is the ability to understand and recommend something to you that obviously extends across all customer groups and the ability to run a warehouse uh, with apparel that looks much more like a fresh food warehouse. And what I mean by that is that the average time that an item sits in our warehouse is less than five days. Um, a normal e-commerce warehouse will do a single turn in a year. So this warehouse moves like nothing that the apparel industry is very used to seeing. So both of those competencies will extend across other consumer groups, but today this is a damn hard business to run in the first place. So we're trying to like keep one thing straight. We don't do accessories, even though we know that that's a revenue opportunity. We give away a affiliate advice to our customers all the time for free, buy these shoes, buy this bag, buy this thing. Like, you know that I'm like, oh, I want that money. 
but um, <laughs> that's like not the business that we're in yet, so we'll get there. Um, the first question, oh, how do we differentiate? So it's really about personalization. Um, that's the, the guiding light to us. Like we, we are her best friend, we've gotta stand behind her, we've gotta be able to recommend things to her. It's really different than the way Rent the Runway thinks about their business. The way they think about their business is, they're, hey, you needed a gown that you couldn't afford. So rent that gown, be a princess for a day, um, and that's awesome. And that has value, um, but it's very different than what we uh, conceptualize ourselves up. We're closest from a technology perspective to Stitch Fix because of the curation aspect and we're trying to get to know you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in the same way that Rent the Runway is an and to a customer's closet, so is Stitch Fix. We are looking to be the closet and be that thing that replaces sort of all the other noise. Thank you. Yeah. Were you basically already an established person to begin with or were you more in your competency? <laughs> So I'll take that as a compliment that I'm a stylish person now. <laughs> um, no, I actually totally built this because I was like, oh, there's got to be a way for me to look like her. <laughs> I will use my computer and figure that out. <laughs> um, but really, yes, that the, the, my impetus was that um, I didn't look like uh, what I thought I could look like. And so I figured out that there had to be a way to you know, use technology and um, stuff like that to achieve a problem or a solution that I wanted to have for myself. So I wouldn't have called myself. You know, I think this is really uh, like you, she's closing off guys, but just the number of guys who know how to use computers but can't dress. It's <laughs> <laughs> bigger than, sorry. That's, yeah. I'm going to get to guys, oh. but focus, right? Yeah, yeah, no, 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 Great question. Money. Um, and what I mean by that is that Are you putting more in? So we, we, we spent the first year and a half um, really trying to validate whether this crazy proposition, could we use a computer to be a personal stylist? Would anyone give us their data? Would literally 100% of our items get rated? That's a crazy proposition. We weren't sure if anyone was willing to do that. So we spent the first year and a half really trying to like figure out whether we could sell this thing. After that, we raised a small amount of money and started spending it on um, digital marketing, and that's where we started to see an uptick. I don't think we could have done one without the other, um, and I still wonder, I probably always will, like, did we really hone it enough before we started to spend? If we would have honed it more, would we have spent more effectively, et cetera, et cetera? And those are things that we continue to rethink. Yes? Uh, when you, that first year when you were kind of um, testing that, yes. those things, did you get uh, investors' money or were you kind of uh, uh, bootstrapping? I don't know the word, but you know what I mean? So I'll give a strong plug to the startup competitions um, because we did just that. So we, we um, got into, I was an MBA at MIT and we got into MIT's accelerator. So we got a tiny amount of money, like literally it was like two and a half thousand dollars or something like that. But it was two and a half thousand dollars that we didn't have before. Um, so we used that, we drove to New York, bought a bunch of stuff on like closeouts and that was how we started the business. Um, I was the algorithm, we didn't have a website, we used a Google form as this great sort of curated closet, um, and we had 20 items that we had bought from some boutique that was going out of, out of, the, out of business. So after that, it's, um, we started generating, oh, oh, I forgot about my lessons. Okay, wait, let me get to my lessons and then I'll come back to this, because this is an important part of the story, because we did start generating revenue on day one. Um, and that, and so we did bootstrap it for a while. Okay. Yes, please. <laughs> yes, plus, <please>. um, <laughs> Okay, I thought that I was done with my blah, blah, blah slides. Okay, here's my last one. Basically, th this is a very large market, and we always knew that. Um, this is like a sketch just to explain like wh how we think that this thing will continue to grow into men, into adjacent, um, uh, services into adjacent customer groups. But what was I supposed to do now? So I have this idea, 
I have an idea that it's a very big market. I even had um, some early kind of indications from my friends mostly that like people wanted to um, consume this as a consumer. So how do you get from there to the next step? And that's what I'm gonna try to share with you. Thank you. Okay, so these are three points that came to mind for me in terms of like advice that I could give you guys about how to move from idea stage onwards. And the first one is how to fight inertia. So inertia is a very powerful and scary thing. Um, it keeps us on track, it makes us move forward, it's routine, it keeps us getting up in the morning, you go to work out or whatever it is that you do, but like we're routine oriented, um, inertia driven creatures. So if you want to do something different than what you were doing before, how do you do that? And for me, I needed external um, kind of pressure uh, to change my trajectory. And so I did apply to an accelerator, we joined a or any pitch competition that would have us. Um, and part of the, the sentiment around that was that like, if we were gonna take ourselves like off a track that was predictable and um, kind of charted, we were gonna have to create, and I shouldn't say we, I should say I, because the, I think for everyone, this, it, it's very different. And for my co-founders, everyone had to do different things to sort of like get there. So this is my version of it. Um, but I did do a lot of kind of like external things to change the inertia of my um, current path. Um, and one of the things I wanted to highlight, uh, and we were also just talking about this, is that th this isn't just a day one problem. This is a problem that we face daily, even three and a half years in, and we'll face for the rest of the life of the company. It's like once you are on a path and it's working, you continue to do the same thing because it works and it's your routine. So how do you make sure that in the same way on day one you uprooted yourself and made a different decision? How do you continue to do that? And so I'll give you guys a specific example. And someone had asked about, oh, the inventory management. So recently, um, we, because we scaled the inventory 4X over the last year, you can imagine that it costs us a lot of money. And so we're constantly like, trying to figure out how are we gonna continue to scale without raising you know, soft bank kind of money and um, turning into a WeWork disaster. So um, a basic assumption that we've had since the beginning was that in order to service a customer well, we need to, ha we need to carry a certain amount of inventory per head. It's a logical assumption, right? Because like how else do we decide how much stuff we carry? So we did some you know, smart math and figured out, okay, this is the number of pieces people rent every month. This appears to be kind of the, um, the quotient for how different people's preferences look. This is how many different sizes we have, silhouettes, and kind of like multiplied it all together and came up with a number. Um, and so we thought that we needed to carry about 13 to 14 pieces per head. And for three years, we maintained that ratio. And that's how we figured out how much inventory to carry. At this, if we continue to to go on this track, um, we would, you know, we would continue to have sort of like a linear um, growth model with the inventory. And so, over the last couple of months, staring at the Excel model and wondering like, how am I going to pull cost out of this thing? I kept coming back to the inventory. Um, but it was, it was a core assumption of the company. Everyone understood the math behind it, so I didn't really think to like break apart that particular thing um, until I started to explain it to other people who had no context in the company. And you know, people who are smart, but like pr it was particularly relevant when they didn't have a ton of context because people would always come back, well, there must be like, scale here where at some point you don't have to carry 13 pieces per customer. And I would sort of dismiss that because this was the version of reality that we had built inside the company. Um, over having many of these conversations, I realized that th there's so many problems with that being a core assumption. First of all, everyone you service is not going to walk through the doors at the same time. That's one of the beauties of like a rotating model. So like, why was I trying to carry Slack inventory for the entire customer group if only 
5% of the people are ever going to walk into the building at the same time. That just took my inventory carrying down by literally 90%. So that's just like a, an example of the fact that there's, we are so blessed to have so many smart people around us. We have incredible investors. And I've explained the logic of this inventory carrying number thousands of times, thousands. And no one has ever been like, that sounds really stupid. <laughs> But now, uh, with just sort of like rethinking this, it's changed the cost model of our business so dramatically. Um, and I share that story just to kind of like try to illustrate that things that you hold as so religiously true as fact, you've got to figure out a way to rethink those things, um, whether it be external people, it be like there's, there's this kill the company thing, which you guys may have or may not have talked about yet, but like, try to get all the people in the room who um, really understand the business and all of you try to attack the company and see like what the weaknesses are that you can pull out. But it is an incredibly powerful thing to examine. Uh, these assumptions that you know to be true, is there any way that they are actually not? I'll give you another example that just happened today. One of the, um, the core things that we believe, and I kind of explain this in the value proposition, is that we will become the replacement of the customer's closet. And yet, the model has always been predicated on a number of items at a time. So our core subscription is four items at a time. You can scale it up to eight, but it's always, the, the guardrail is a number of items. That doesn't actually line up with an unlimited subscription because I just put a very distinct limit on it. And today we tried to break that apart just kind of like with our team and what happens if we really offered an unlimited subscription? You could rent anything. If you want 100 things, you could do it. 200 things. What, what would happen? Um, and we're really trying to like think through this in real time because like it actually, we, we have some idea of what people's like consumption behavior is the average person will not consume 100 things. They'll probably consume one or two. You know, will those like, sort of like behavior patterns uh, normalize out? I don't know. But we have to be willing and have the guts and have the fallback plan to try stuff that's like really random. Like even saying it out loud, I, it's like, w w could we really offer an unlimited closet? That sounds crazy. But maybe we actually could. I don't know. Um, and so. My basic point is like figure out a way always, whether it's this on this day one or it's on day 300 or whatever, that the inertia that you have built behind you, you take yourself off that track and try to rethink something from premise one and don't believe anything you know to be true to be true because you said it was. Second, thank you. Um, okay, here's another one that I believe in very strongly. Uh, you gotta sell stuff. Unless you're running a beautiful nonprofit, you are probably trying to sell something to somebody, um, and there's got to be a transaction there. And that, I think, is something that is sometimes lost in the uh, formation process, um, especially as technologists. Building cool technology is really fun. Um, does anyone want to buy it? I don't know. Uh, and I think it's really important that you figure out on day one do people want to buy it? And this is just an illustration. These are my real screenshots of what it was like that first summer. I mean, I was selling stuff to anybody who would talk to me, literally. Like this last one is like some girl I met in the Uber. Um, and as you can see, I was like selling her stuff. This one is my very best friend from business school, still customer one. And the, the first transaction, she was like, hey, I'm going to this wedding. Can I borrow a dress that I owned? And I was like, you could rent it from me. And she's like, are you nuts? And I was like, no, but you gotta rent it from me. I probably am nuts, but um, it's just like, I, I hope that uh, for all of you, as you figure out kind of like, what is the pressure testing mechanism here? Remember that like, if this business is based on a transaction, 
make sure that you have early indication that people really want to buy the thing. Am I running out of time? No, okay. I'm saying you're also going to, you never stop selling. Oh. <laughs> and she's not stopping selling. I'm not. We've got a bunch of cards here for you to subscribe. So uh, should I pass them back or should it, we? Yes, and this is a new thing we're trying. So tell me whether this QR code here. thing is yeah, cool for you. <laughs> and it's buy one, get one free because it's the first some. month of the year. So you buy one month. <laughs> <laughs> if you're environmentally conscious, just take a picture. So okay. sorry. No. You really do love Millie? Sorry. That's her. This is the other person. Okay, okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'll finish up so that I can take your questions. My last one uh, is yes, okay. Last thing passion. Why does it matter? This is my own opinion. Um, but. Help, talking to John honestly like helped me really crystallize this. I've, I'm obviously incredibly passionate about this business, but what does that mean and why does it matter? And I think the biggest reason that it matters is because I think about it all the time. And that's really fun for me. Like everything that I learn, I put it back in this framework of like, what about at Armoire if we did X, Y, and Z? I finally went on my first real vacation over the last two weeks in Ecuador. And like, I was looking at the turtles and being like, oh, that's so interesting. Look, the turtle likes sharing its environment with its other turtle. <laughs> and, like they seem to be getting value out of the sharing process. That is so interesting. I wonder if there's something to be learned there. But like, I'm fully obsessed. Um, and it helps me sort of like be able to understand that I think about this thing all the time, not because I have to, it's because I like this problem. And my view of the world now is completely like through this different lens. Um, and I think it, that it has helped me in the hiring process to hire people that are like that as well, because you, as an employer, you're capturing hopefully not mo much more than 40 hours of people sort of like in the office time, right? Like you want everyone to have a life, you want them to go away and like do the things that they need to do to keep their life, blah, blah, blah. But if they really love the problem and they're really passionate about it and they're curious, they're going to be on the soccer field with so other soccer moms or whatever talking about stuff and thinking about your problem. And so your ability to capture their idle mind space, you don't have to fight for that because they're curious and they're obsessed. So I think for me, what has been valuable about this word passion and Hiring and hiring for it and trying to interview for it is that those people who are truly curious about the problem end up being just more sort of innovative and productive because I get all their brain space all the time. And it's not that they look the same as each other because like back to failing business school number one of like doing one thing and doing it well, we have everyone from data scientists to stylists to incredible operations people who think about how to you know pack the boxes better but whatever it is it's like this core problem is super interesting to them even though they bring a different um, lens or sort of set of experiences to it uh, and that's one of the reasons that I think we've been able to um, innovate and sort of succeed in this really kind of like not clean business, right? No pun intended. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a difficult one. And so if I could leave you with that as sort of advice for yourself as well as like for the people that you find to join you, just make sure that it's something that, yeah, when you see turtles, you're like, oh, does this fit into my framework? Um, and then you'll know that it's something that for you, at least you won't be bored thinking about it. And in that way, you'll out innovate the people who are just showing up as their job. I'm all done. I'll take questions. <laughs>
I mean, I, th I've heard that as well, and, and there are times that it feels lonely. I think for me, it was important to have people around me because I'm an extremely extroverted person, and if I had been all the way by myself, I don't know that I would have made it this far. Um, I think that the things that are yours and yours alone as the CEO is things that are incredibly stressful, like payroll, which I have almost missed many times, <laughs> um, and people stuff where people are unhappy um, or th you know things go wrong in their life that you can't fix. Like those are the things like that are incredibly lonely. Uh, you end up knowing things about people's lives that are sometimes lovely and fantastic and sometimes terrible and there's not really like anyone that you can share that with or anything you can do about it um, and so those are the things that are very lonely um, and i think for me i'm really lucky to have a family around me that is incredibly supportive and my husband has a real job <laughs> and like <laughs> has been supporting the arm larger armoire family for many moons at, at one point the entire team lived in our house and this is after he had lived by himself for two years because I was in business school. So I came back not only with no real job, but also with like four other people. And I was like, hey, <laughs> we're going to run this business out of our house and all these people live here. <laughs> um, so I'm incredibly lucky that I have people around me. And also, I, it, it, even beyond him, it's like my, my parents are incredibly curious, supportive. Um, I have this incredible group of female founders. And this is one point I would like to make. Um, the data about women running companies and particularly technology companies is very bad and it's not untrue. Yes, like the VC dollars are not flowing in our way. There's few of them, et cetera, et cetera. But what that story does not tell is the fierceness of the group. Um, there are probably 10 to 20 um, in Seattle who are just this, I call them my she dragons, literally. <laughs> Um, they're everything. They're, they're on text with me about like crazy stuff that you shouldn't be able to text people. Like, what should I pay my CFO? I have 30 minutes. <laughs> like that should be like a, oh, we have lunch. Like we really talk about it. But no, it's like they understand like where I am and like how this thing works. And that is such a strong competitive advantage that women will have until we don't need to have it anymore. Um, that really, I think, th today, it's the moment. So if any of the she-dragons are thinking about starting companies, know that you will walk into the most powerful network of incredible women that will pull you up in all kinds of different ways. So I don't know where I was rambling on about that. What was the original <laughs> question? Sorry. <laughs> oh, right. So find your she-dragons or your he-dragons. That's also OK. Yes. So I had just taken this class about how the um, they did this like gigantic study at MIT about co-founders, and it was like the uh, worst co-founder that you could find was a friend, the second worst was family, and the best was um, oh, and then the third worst was like a rando, and the fourth was somebody that you uh, the best was somebody that you had worked with before. Everyone who started with me was my friend. Now I hadn't worked with any of them before, so I did everything wrong. Um, but at, at the time, it was like, I was basically looking for people who wanted to spend a summer working on this crazy problem. They thought it was interesting. We all got along. Um, and so the way I found them, I guess, was like selling the dream, which is what I continue to do. Things have changed in that now I have more to sell, less dream, more reality. And I think that has allowed me to hire for competence rather than just sort of friendship, um, which is a huge thing. Uh, but the, the way I really found them was like the people around me. And I was lucky to have really smart, really passionate people uh, in the beginning. Uh, one thing that is true is that most of my leadership team has changed. So I only have one person from the early days and none of the original co-founders.
That said, it was an incredibly unpainful process. Like when I was in school, all those horror stories were about like, oh, if you lose your lose your co-founder, like the whole business is gonna die. And um, this is only one person's experience. But for me, it's like it has always been a kind of generous, sort of like loving two-way parting. Um, equity has gone out the door, but I'm okay with that because they built this business with me when no one else was. And when we had $2,000 in the bank and we ate ramen together all the time. So I think like if your heart is in the right place um, and you recognize the value that people are bringing to the business, like you can find people um, that are gonna, they're gonna change different stages, different folks. Yes. So you mentioned in like, uh, I feel like a big part of finding inertia is like your the normal prescribed path is really safe. Yes. Right? And it's the and versus like starting a new business, like who knows if it's gonna work. What was the moment for you that was like, wait, this is something that could actually work. I don't need to go down that prescribed path anymore. This I can put everything into this, and you felt safe doing that. So uh, that's a great question, and I think this also is a very personal because I've heard a lot of CEOs talk about like kind of like how the clouds parted and then they could see the light or something like that. That never happened to me. I took incremental steps and I continue to do that. And so making that tactical, what I mean by that is like when I applied to MIT's accelerator, I already had a full-time offer at the consulting firm in Seattle. And so at first I applied and you know that was just my mini step. Oh, okay, now I got in. Now, oh, I have to tell the partner, but I'm gonna ask him for three months. So I originally asked him for three months, then the three months turned into six months, and the six months turned into nine months. But even like raising money or hiring the first employee, like it all felt incremental. And I think one of the things that stuck with me was that when we were um, applying to the accelerator, I think it was like one of the judges or something said something to me about like, um, MBAs always get stuck in analysis paralysis. Um, like, do you think you're going to too? And I was like, oh. <laughs> You don't know me. Um, so that, that has like stuck with me that like you got to just keep moving and don't sort of get overwhelmed by what's going to happen when this thing, one that scares me, what is going to happen when I finally have to move my warehouse like more than 20 miles from where I live? I have no idea what that's going to look like, but if I got stuck on that on day one when the warehouse existed in my apartment, it would have been like a really silly thing to sort of get wrapped up in. So I try to solve for the things that are in front of me. So I never had a cloud parting moment. I think we can take one or two more questions. Yes. Um, I'm curious why the, think about like rethink or challenge norms, why the one month commitment? Because every clothing subscription or typical subscription that I can think of is one month. But it's one of your proposals is, or propositions is like personalized, hyper flexible, then what makes it hang on to the, that unit of time. And the reason I raise that is there's some decision fatigue baked into a monthly commitment. Yep. Whereas for a customer like me, I would love to take a journey with Armoire as a personalized shopper, but like to use the traveling industry, I customize my travel based on the mood that I'm in. It could be a three day you know, resort where I do nothing, or it could be a three month backpacking trip that it's like on and off the way I want to. So if I, an example of this, where this would have been perfect is I just went down to California. I'm not a California girl. Yes. Uh, I want to know how to dress like a California girl, go be hip like a California girl. I would have signed up for a week's worth of California girl curated clothes, but that was for my trip and my vacation. So th there's a company called Adam that recently came out and they are they caught my attention because they were offering one extra unit of personalized personalization and it was just 0.25 of a foot size but it caught my attention because yep. it was breaking through the noise of like yet another shoe company like Allbirds. Um, I've heard of Armoire. It didn't quite break through that noise for me because it was just another month long clothing subscription. Yep. So I just want to interject. Thank you because now MBG is going to come again next year. <laughs> Yeah. These kinds of questions. That, I mean, that is, a, yes, I totally agree. That is a, it's a great question. I don't have a good answer to it. I mean, in the same way that we sort of arbitrarily put the guardrails up around four items, we somewhat arbitrarily put the guardrail up around a month. One thing that we don't do is the single rental because we don't learn enough about you to be able to turn that wheel. Somebody asks, like, how do you make sure that she's willing to give you information and and so we don't think that we'll learn enough through the one thing. Um, 
But it, it is a fair question, like, what, why a month? Why not a week? Why not eight things? Why four things? So I think that's great. And I don't, I don't have a good answer to it. I should think about it. So I'm going to uh, have to yes. cut you off because yes. I, we got to close the class. If you are willing to stay for yes. a few minutes, that'd be great. But I want to thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. I All right. Oh no, we're kidding. Oh wait, this is your phone. Your phone. Okay, don't leave yet. Hold on. Do not leave. Do not leave. Okay. I have a few last things to say. Okay. So first, I want to summarize. We went through the basics. We're going to have three su sections: product, uh, plan, and pitch. Please uh, tell me stuff through surveys, participation, and practice, uh, and use my office hours. Um, these competitions are really exciting. Go to the Burke Center and find out more about them. And then lastly, I just wanted to thank Ambika again because she was a great introduction to what I think are several key themes you're going to hear over and over again, like think ahead, right? Use your brain, question your assumptions, both question the assumptions of the world, so you might have a reason to change them, question your assumptions yourself, and then actually get moving and sell all the time. So the, that was great. Next time, I just want to highlight to you, we're going to have another terrific speaker, Renee Xiaoyu Wang. She is the founder of CastBox, which is the fastest growing spoken audio platform in the world. She built this in her apartment uh, in Beijing. Uh, amazing person. Panel of past participants who can tell you how to win and how not to win. Uh, and then we're actually going to have a little party after class with food, I think that I mentioned, to help you form teams. Please fill out your survey and read at least the required readings, uh, but also maybe the other ones. Uh, and uh, lastly, I'd like to say, be careful out there, because as we know, this is quite an interesting challenge. So thank you very much. Excited to have you guys. MBAs, please come over here.